Many people with whom I interact in the cannabis community specifically ask me a very common question, paraphrased as, If I use predatory mites, won't they defecate in the flower? I don't think people want to smoke bug poop. It's a very understandable question. From a health and safety or quality control standpoint, it might seem like an extreme but well-intentioned query, but it does belie some misunderstanding of the physiologies of both predatory mites and plants. For starters, predatory mites, like many arthropods with poor eyesight, are highly sensitive to volatile chemicals and use them to navigate their surroundings through a process called chemotaxis. Secondarily, several structures like the glandular trichomes known in cannabis flowers and other plants are sticky and disallow many light arthropods like gnats and mites from moving once they make contact. For these reasons, Many organisms have a sensitivity that incline them to avoid certain compounds found in trichomes while being attracted to others, like herbivore-induced plant volatiles. HIPVs are produced passively or actively by plants when damaged in a specific way, which can help predators and parasites find their prey. Now, none of this is to say that predatory mites couldn't be found in the calyx of a cannabis plant or indeed the trichomous parts of other plants. I myself have observed them, particularly in the early stages of flowering when the inflorescence is much less developed. However, there are many factors to take into consideration. There is research that shows a reduction in the speed and target acquisition of mites such as Amblyseus swirskii, Phytocilius persimilis, and Neocilius californicus when navigating dense trichomes. In one report, increasing densities of trichomes per square centimeter markedly decreased walking speed, which was cited as typically 0.5 to 1 millimeter per second. In fact, the tops of non-glandular hair-like trichomes are common sites for Sursgii to lay their eggs. The conclusions of certain research initiatives clearly state that the control provided by Sursgii and other predatory mites is impaired in crops like tomato. Angeliki Paspati of Wageningen University observed in her research that the acyl sugars produced by tomato trichomes would build up in the cuticle of Swirskii during travel, blocking respiration physically and disrupting cell function when consumed during cleaning, ultimately leading to death. To corroborate, I've observed Sursgii failing to move along the glandular trichomes of petunias, which are very similar to those of cannabis in terms of, let's call it, stick factor. Predatory mites are not equipped to traverse sticky substances and cannot make their way through sufficiently sticky trichomes as evidence in this footage. So, what is a cultivator to do? Are beneficial mites a hazard to the end consumer's health? Do they taint the product? Well, there's no conclusive evidence that says feces of predatory mites in particular are hazardous to one's health to my knowledge, but there is a lot of circumstantial evidence that points to a low likelihood that predatory mites would be active in that part of the plant. Additionally, following this train of thought leads to more questions regarding food quality, pest presence, and other realities that many people don't like to consider or haven't, and I believe it is a disconnect from the agricultural norm from which the inquiry develops. For example, it's pretty much impossible to produce agricultural products at any scale without some instance of pest impurities. The FDA details so-called acceptable foreign matter on a product-by-product -product basis in a publication entitled The Food Defect Action Levels, Levels of Natural or Unavoidable Defects in Foods that Present No Health Hazards for Humans. Though it concerns the waste of mammals like rats and other objects associated with pests, Insect fragments and frass in particular are considered a purely aesthetic problem. Ingestion and inhalation are very different modes of consumption, but I want to impress upon people that while it might seem gross or contemptible or incorrect to allow a product to have any level of insect parts residing inside, 
it truly isn't the hazard that some worry it might be. In many parts of the world, people eat insects and spiders either as famine food or a delicacy. There are microbes all around us. Fermentation of foods wouldn't be nearly as easy if fruits and vegetables didn't have a host of organisms living on their exterior. On the other hand, though, mycotoxins from molds and other fungi can be incredibly acutely toxic, and care must be made to ensure one doesn't become exposed needlessly. Even the act of breathing exposes one's lungs to spores, natural and artificial fibers, dandruff, soil particles, and myriad other things at an even greater intensity indoors. In reality, all actions are the result of a cost-benefit analysis made with oneself. Some things seem intuitive to avoid, but others aren't, and it can be a very contentious subject. When I have to give an answer to the question, if I use biocontrol agents, won't they poop in my cannabis? I give the answer that, yes, I'm sure that it happens, both for pests like spider mites, russet mites, broad mites, white fly, all kinds of pests, and their predators, lace wings, ladybirds, predatory mites of all kinds. And in most cases, people are asking this question in the sense of it being an alternative to the use of pesticidal agents which is often the attraction to using biocontrol agents, is that one doesn't have to use them, even minimum risk pesticides. Even when cultivators decide to use pesticides, the fecal remains of pests will still be there. So whether somebody is using a biocontrol agent or a pesticidal agent, the waste of some sort of organism is still expected to be on the product at the very end of its harvest.